I was once asked in an interview, what surprised me most about it, the American Revolution as I became more educated about it? And two things came to mind. I had always believed that the revolution was a tax revolt. I was surprised that this was not so. And I had always learned that the colonies separated because over the course of the 150 years of colonial life, the colonists were gradually Americanized. They became less like British people across the sea. They became less British and more American in their culture and habits and ideals and values. The revolution of 1776, according to this view, was generations in the making. 1776 just gave political form to the real revolution that had taken place in the hearts and minds of Americans gradually, step by step, over the course of the colonial era. That's how I learned about the revolution. Um, its, orig its origins were tracked for me all the way back to the first generation of settlers. It was a story of a constant and growing cultural divide between colonists and mother country. And the final story, uh, and the uh, final chapter of this story start, started in 1776 and ended in 1789 with the establishment of the Union under the new federal constitution. This is how it's taught in Israel where I grew up and went to college. It's how it's taught in American schools and colleges and grad schools. And we all learn it also from the culture, from movies, novels, documentaries about the era, etc. I don't see it that way now. Separation was not gradual over generations. It came abruptly in those 10 or 15 years before the revolution because of a constitutional crisis. The Americans were British and they remained British. And they rebelled because they were British, not because they had become different. When the British government started to centralize the imperial bureaucracy, the colonists in America responded with a traditionally English res resistance to arbitrary government. The same kind of resistance on display in England during the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. Two rebellions launched by Parliament against a sitting king in 1642 and again in 1688 in response to what they saw as the king establishing centralized and arbitrary rule. So the American rebellion resembled those two great English rebellions of the 17th century. And just like those English rebels a century earlier, these rebels in the colonies were not trying to create something new, but to preserve something old, to preserve the status quo, not to change it. It was Charles I who was trying to change the patterns of English governance, not the parliamentarians who rebelled against him in the English Civil War. It was James II who was trying to change the system, not the parliament that ousted him in 1688. Similarly, in the 1760s and 70s, it was the British Parliament, not the American assemblies, which was trying to change the status quo. So once I became a convert on the origins and purpose and nature of the revolution, I started wondering, probably like all converts do, uh, I wondered, how did I not see this? Why were my eyes so close to this all this, uh, closed to this all these years? Because it seemed obvious in hindsight. And my conclusion was that it's, it wasn't my fault. Every book, every textbook, every syllabus, and every movie I had come across ended the revolution in 1789 with the new constitution and George Washington presiding over the Union. When our teachers and authors and movie makers end the story in 1789, it's virtually impossible for the audience not to see it, not, not to see the revolution as a story of change, as a, rev as a revolt designed to create a new system of government, a new philosophy of government, a new country for a new nation. Because that federal constitution certainly is that. It draws up a new system of government and it created a new and sovereign country in North America. But that story has a hidden hitch and that well-hidden hitch is the first constitution of the United States, the Articles of Confederation. And this constitution, the first constitution, was not a new system of government. 
not a new philosophy of government. And it definitely did not create a new and sovereign state for the Americans. We all learned the uh, revolutionary story with the Articles of Confederation obscured from view. They get mentioned as a half paragraph bridging the end of the war to the beginning of the federal or constitutional convention. We, we race ahead to the study of the second constitution under which we live today, live today, and we pay little attention to the constitution that the revolutionists created for themselves when they won the war. And it suggests that we're more interested in learning about our country today, about our constitution, than about the country that they established for themselves with their revolution. What I'm suggesting is that the revolutionists saw the Articles as the end point of the revolution, which means that we should too. The revolutionists believed that the revolution was over in 1783 and we should follow their lead rather than make them follow our lead. Once we highlight the Articles of Confederation as the end and the purpose of the revolution, the revolution emerges as most revolutionists understood it, as a backward-looking movement to preserve old English liberties, a movement that looked to, the, to past precedent to preserve the old status quo, instead of a movement to create a new system of government for a new nation. Now, of course, the federal constitution, the second constitution, was very important, and it's very important to us because it's our system of government. But it was not the product of the revolution of 1776. When the victorious revolutionists set up a government for themselves to correct the abuses of parliament, they created the Articles, not the federal constitution. The content of the Articles reflected the complaints that they had in the 1760s and 70s. The Articles of Confederation fixed those parliamentary abuses that they had complained about in the 60s and 70s. By the same token, the content of the Second Constitution reflected complaints that Americans had after the Revolution in the 1780s. The Second Constitution tells us about the complaints and the aims of Federalists in the 1780s. It does not tell us about the complaints and aims of the Revolutionists of 1776.